Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, we are going to explore some curious folklore, which includes witchcraft, tormented spirits, voodoo dolls, and some good old-fashioned Wicker Man-style paganism to begin with. And all of this concerns Wells. Yes, Wells. W-E-L-L-S, Wells. And not the city in England, but those magical creations which have been supplying people with water for centuries. If you've ever read a fairy tale, I imagine at some point somebody has pulled water out of the well using a bucket. Now, this is the latest in a semi-regular series on this podcast, looking at the folklore of water. In the past, we've looked at the folklore of rivers, of the sea, of streams. This time out, it's wells, and while the water might be more static, shall we say, it's captive water, it is no less fascinating, and it is certainly no less creepy as you will soon discover. Now, quickly, before we begin, I should point out that all of this folklore was recorded in the early 1900s. It was written down and published in the early 1900s. But of course, it dates from times much earlier than that. And our first one concerns a well called Gethi Onen Well in the Swansea Valley near Gethi Onen Chapel, not too far from Pontedawi in Neath Port Talbot. And this magical well was particularly popular in times of drought, because, to quote, we are told that the well was formerly frequented by people in seasons of drought for the purpose of getting some of the water, which, when thrown or scattered about, would bring rain. Because by performing some strange ritual there, you could not only guarantee that the well itself would be replenished, but you could bring rain to other places as well. It's a bit like performing a a Welsh version of a rain dance, I guess. And it's the kind of thing, what I'm about to describe to you, I would love to see in person one day. But to quote, we are told that the well was formerly frequented by people in seasons of drought for the purpose of getting some of the water, which, when thrown or scattered about, would bring rain. So that part of it all sounds quite straightforward, if a bit wasteful in times of drought. You gather that water, you scatter it about, but the hope is by scattering it, you'll generate a heck of a lot more water when it rains. But there's more to it, and to quote an old man, no name sadly, but an old man in the early 1900s, so when he was growing up in the 1800s at some point, he remembers in his childhood that People would dance on the nearest green spot to the well and throw flowers and bunches of herbs at each other. Then they would sing old-fashioned Welsh ballads and play Kiss in the Ring, which is an old children's game. And the leader of the company going to the well would cry, Bring us rain three times. And as I record this, it is absolutely torrential outside, and I can't imagine anyone in Wales asking for rain for quite some time. But anyway, if you did want rain, that's what you'd do. And back to it. The people, chiefly youths and maidens, would fill bowls or pitchers with the water and either throw it there or carry it home to scatter upon the garden. And, as a result, rain always followed. So, there's quite a lot going on there, but just to recap quickly, just in case you fancy trying this at home, but they'd head to the nearest spot of Greenland, the nearest spot of grass near to the well. The youths and maidens, the boys and girls, would throw herbs and flowers at each other. I'm guessing that wouldn't hurt too much. They'd sing some songs, play some games... And then, after the leader demanded that this well bring us rain, bring us rain, bring us rain, it would indeed 
follow after they'd filled their bowls of pitchers with that water and thrown it on the ground or scattered it upon their garden, presumably to bring rain specifically to their property, their crops. And in this way, it makes the magical properties of this well portable. You can then take the water away and use it where it's needed. So while it might sound like a curious tradition, if it works, it works. I mean, I can't talk from personal experience, but in the 1800s, it certainly seemed to do the trick. Now, another well with a curious story attached to it is the well dedicated to St. David in the Ceredigion village of Hain Vanu, and it goes like this. Another old man, there's a lot of old men in this episode, but another old man went to this well alone on Midsummer Eve, which, as regular listeners will know, in Wales is one of the three spirit nights, one of the Aspirid Norse, much like Halloween. But he was at this well alone on Midsummer Eve, and while there, he heard a voice from the waters down in the well calling, help, help. He looked around everywhere, but not a person was visible. The man sat down to rest because he was tired and thought no more of the cry. But later on, he heard the same cry twice repeated. Who calls for help, he asked, going to the well. It is I, said the voice. I am calling. Who are you, asked the man, and a hand was stretched from under the well, and the voice bade the man to clasp it and hold tight. All of which sounds very ominous indeed. I think most of us, if a hand stretched out of the dark old well, asking for help on one of the spirit nights on an Asprid Norse, it's like something out of a 1990s horror film. I think most of us would run a mile. But... What does this old man do? Well, these events took place a long time before any 1990s horror films were made, so we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. But he does indeed clasp that hand. But we are told that hand was slippery and he couldn't keep a grip on it. And he loosened his hold, letting go once more. And as the mysterious fingers vanished back, into the darkness, he could hear that ethereal voice crying out, I am bound for another 50 years. And as I've mentioned before on this podcast, sadly, with some of these tales like this one, which are reported as being true, I'm not saying they are true, but they're reported as actual events. A lot of them don't have nice, tidy endings. And that is very much the case here. That is the end of the tale. And it would appear like maybe this was some kind of lost soul in need of help. Or maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was trying to trick that old man and to pull him into the darkness. But whatever the case, it appeared to be condemned for another 50 years. Maybe this old man messed things up and as a result he condemned this this poor soul to 50 years of torment. But what I do know is that if this was published in the early 1900s that would suggest there's been at least two more occasions if not more for somebody else to go along and attempt to save this soul. Somebody hopefully with a sturdier grip Someone wearing gloves, ideally, would be good, wouldn't it? If you ever visit this well, take a pair of gloves, because you never know, you might be pulling some banished ghost out of the bottom of a well. But let's move on to the next one. And we are going to head further north again, right up into modern day Conway for this one, where we are told that somewhere between Abigail and Llandidno is a spring called Fanon Elian or St. Elian's Well in English. And it's a bit vague in the original folklore, but it's assumed to be the well in the village of Llan Elian and Hros, and is where, in days gone by, some skullduggery, we are told, would take place. Because, to quote, people maliciously inclined, which is a nice way of saying people up to no good, but people maliciously inclined, formerly used to come from all parts of Wales under the pretense 
of drinking the healing waters. So they would go there in disguise as pilgrims, as genuine pilgrims. But in reality, they came to obtain the waters for bewitching their enemies. So this well was being used by two kinds of people who both sought some miraculous, some magical abilities from it. On the one hand, the genuine pilgrims who wanted to be healed by it. On the other hand, those maliciously inclined people who wanted to use it to bewitch people. Now, one person in particular, a farmer in Breckenshire, as the county was then, having heard of this, took two small barrels and placing them pannier fashion on his horse, so one balanced either side, went all the way to Abigail for water from Fanon Elian, with which to punish his enemies. And after filling up these barrels, he returned home back down to Brackenshire and placed the barrels in his outhouse. The next morning, he went to get some water to throw after one of his enemies. You can just picture this. It's like a, a vampire hunter throwing holy water at a vampire, maybe. But the barrels burst and the water fell over him with the result that he was bewitched ever afterwards. And so the suggestion here is that this holy water is so holy if you try and use it for evil reasons, it will backfire. If you try and bewitch someone with it, it will in turn bewitch you. And as a result, it gained something of a reputation and became closely connected with many terrible superstitions. So you had to be extra careful with this holy water. It was like dynamite. Yes, maybe you could use it for some bad reason, but you might pay the price as well. And as a result, some of the old people, back to old people, but old people generations ago called it the Well of Evil, which is a bit of a giveaway. And as a result, it was shunned by all respectable persons. So this reputation kept away the genuine God-fearing people as well. And as a result of all this, there was one man, one person who did profit from all of this. You could say he made a tidy living or, you know, at least a profitable sideline from the well's supposed evilness because he lived beside the well and he began to act as a clerk of sorts. And when, to quote, he was consulted by persons who bore malice to somebody. So when somebody wanted to bewitch someone, to injure them bodily or mentally or both, the clerk undertook to gratify their needs if they paid him a good sum for his work and secrecy. So to clarify quickly, if you wanted to bewitch someone in a nasty way, you could ask the clerk who was living next door to the well to do it for you. And one of the things that was done is that the man or woman's name, the would-be victim's name, was written in his book. Then a pin was stuck in the name, and a stone was inscribed with the initials of the person to be bewitched, and this stone was thrown in the well. So there was no stealing water this time, it was about throwing something into the well. And so long as that stone remained in the well, the curse would work. When anyone desired to remove the curse, the pebble was taken out of the water and the name erased from the clerk's book. So if you were bewitched, you needed to get your name crossed out. And sometimes a rude figure of marl, wax or dough was thrown into the well and kept in the water for any desired period. So I guess you could describe that as some 18th century Welsh voodoo doll. And we do have a tale where all of these elements were put together and put to use. A name was recorded in the clerk's book at Fanon Elian because a woman believed her husband to be guilty of infidelity and desired to punish him. So, what does she do? You guessed it, she goes to the well. She made a figure 
of Mal, one of these voodoo doll type constructions, and stuck it with pins in the place where the heart would be. She then registered his name in the clerk's book and lowered the Mal figure into the water. There it remained for a week, during which her husband suffered tortures of pain in his heart. At the end of the week, she had the Mal figure drawn up from the well and stuck the head of it closely with the pins removed from the heart. So she took the pins out of one part of the body and stuck them into another. She stuck them into his head and accordingly the suffering was removed from that organ to the brain and he became almost mad. After successive tortures of various kind and in different parts of the body for several months, the man altered his behaviour and expressing penitence was forgiven by his wife. Now that all sounds quite extreme granted but you know if, if your marriage is on the rocks all you need is a few pins a doll shaped like your other half and a trip to Fanon Elian where the clerk can work his magic. Well that's assuming the tradition has been passed on but you know I, I like to think so maybe somebody could visit and and check it out for me. Now it's not just marital bliss that the world can help with. Another story concerns a man whose uncle had been cruel and unjust to him. He made an image of wax, stuck it with pins, tied it to a lump of copper, and suspended it over the well by a piece of cord. The man then uttered secret words of cursing, in which he desired that his uncle might continually suffer severe pain and lose money, property, and possessions. So this is one heck of a curse he's boiling up here for his uncle. The figure was lowered into the well, plunged three times in succession, and then allowed to remain in the bottom. The uncle remained under the ban until the nephew promised to release him on payment of a certain sum of money. This was done and the curse was removed. The story goes that the uncle suffered severe pain. Some of his property was burnt to the ground and a stranger robbed him while under the curse. So as those examples illustrated, the well had multiple uses and I think it also serves as conclusive proof that Fanon Elian, in the past at least, certainly lived up to its nickname as the Well of Evil. All of which wraps up this look at the weird wells of Wales and another episode of the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. But we've still only just scratched the surface of this watery folklore and there is more on the way. So as always, if you've enjoyed this episode and you don't want to miss any upcoming episodes, be sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you've really enjoyed it and you'd like to support the podcast, you can now treat me to a coffee via my website or you can just give it a quick thumbs up or five stars or nice review or whatever the option is on whatever platform you are consuming this on. And as well as a podcast, I've also written a number of books about similar weird and wonderful subjects, the most recent being Paranormal Whales, which are available from all good bookshops offline and on. And if you'd like more ghosts and folklore, you can, of course, follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. And if you do, be sure to say hello. And on that note, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian am Rando. I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast, beaming to you from Wales to the world. Until next time. No star.